What's up, Nick? How are you? I'm good, Grant. Thanks. Thanks for having me, man. It's an honor and a privilege, man. Right on, man. I mean, it's an honor and privilege to have you on my show, man. Just growing up and seeing you play and ball and dominate, um, man, this is just a real treat for me. And, you know, we're going to keep it simple today. We're just going to talk about the mental game. We're going to talk about your mental game. We're going to talk about preparation and how to overcome adversity. So there's a lot of things we're going to be talking about today, and, and I'm real excited to have you on my show. All right. All right. Let's, let's do it. <laughs> let's do it. All right. Well, let's talk about mental toughness. Um, man, did I see you man, more than once be mentally tough without your, or through, throughout your career. So what does mentally tough mean to you? Well, uh, that can be defined in, in, in many ways, uh, especially when you out on the football field, baseball, basketball. Um, it's not necessarily just backing down from an opponent. You know, uh, it, it can be you, you're mentally prepared for who you're about to, to go against, who you're about to face, uh, uh, the things that you need to do or uh, – or should do while you out out there. Uh, I use a uh, a prime example, and I, I I mention this guy all the time because he's uh, if not the greatest, one of the greatest of all time, and that's Michael Jordan. Oh yeah. Um, you have to be mentally prepared to face a guy like that because mentally, if he see a weakness in you, he's going to take advantage of it. Um, and I always try to get mentally prepared to face a guy like that uh, because I, I know my physical ability was there but mentally are you mentally ready for this challenge and I try to prepare myself to 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 go against a, a Michael Jordan and not not just a Michael Jordan a, a Reggie Miller a Clyde Drexler uh, I can go on down the line uh, uh, Joe Dumas because those guys were mentally tough as well as physically tough and if you're not mentally ready to go against some guys I don't care how physical you are you're going to get dominated right up from start to finish so I had to prepare myself for those challenges like that night in and night out and uh, stay focused on what the the capabilities are uh, you know what we talk about when you're on the floor uh, sweet spots uh, yeah uh, that that type of thing. Just be prepared of, uh, uh, of what's ahead, the challenge that's ahead. If you're not prepared for that challenge, you lost already. <laughs> right. Well, you speak of, you, you brought up Michael Jordan. When you talk about being mentally prepared for someone like him, what's the night before like? I mean, I can only imagine what it's like, you know, the week before and the day of, but like the night before when you, before you go to bed and you know that you're going to ball out against one of the best players that's ever played. What goes through your mind? How do you prepare yourself for that? Well, first of all, it's, it's, it, you know, you're thinking about uh, uh, a guy like MJ It's that, that nervous energy. I, w I would think uh, you're nervous because you're going against considerably the best player that ever laced up a pair of sneakers. Uh, <laughs> you, you're thinking about uh, the things that he's capable of doing, and there was nothing that he couldn't do. So your mind is just going 100. Well, uh, I got to stop him from doing this. I got to stop him from doing that. Basically, you got to try to stop him from doing any and everything. So you, I got, uh, for myself, you know, I always want to, you know, uh, play well and, and be competitive uh, against uh, 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 MJ. Uh, it, it was hard, but it was, it was, it was, it was something that was fun. Right. You know, it was fun to go against him because uh, your work was, your work is never done. Right. Your work is never done. And I tell young ball players today, you, you just don't understand. Your work is never done when you're facing him. I mean, that's on both ends of the floor. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> because the guy was mentally tough offensively, and he was mentally tough defensively. So uh, your work is never done. But I try to prepare myself and, and, and just go out and, 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 and make everything kind of tough for him. 
uh, shots, being physical with him, uh, a hand in his face. Because a guy like you're not gonna stop him, right? <laughs> you just gotta try to, to just slow make down. things, yeah, slow him down, make things a little bit harder than they they may be for him if you can. Mm. And that's with a hand in the face, and you know, try to throw him off of a a, 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 a shot, or a move that he's trying to make, things like that. That being mentally, uh, and you have to be mentally prepared again. Like I said for 48 minutes because whenever the ball is in his hands, you kind of say, well, you're at his mercy. Right. <laughs> you see, that, that's what you have to understand because uh, uh, how great of an offensive player he was. And uh, respect, rightfully so, he was just as dominant on the defensive end as he was offense. So just try to stay within in, in, in my game mentally not getting thrown off, uh, uh, so to speak. You know, try to stay at a, if I will may say this, uh, even kill if you yeah, want right. to say that. <laughs> you know, uh, it, it was just, it was hard, but uh, it was fun. And I, I and with all due respect to other players in the league that I I guarded, I mean, it was it was forty eight minutes of hell. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. 48 minutes well it's it's one thing to to physic for 48 minutes you know play against him physically and i understand the, the mental there is a mental part for sure but what about because we all know that he loves to talk and when he when he gets inside you how do you how do you mentally deal with that when he's chattering at you <laughs> and dominating at the same time oh it, it was it was hard grant I, I i tell you it was hard when you got a guy like you just mentioned he's talking smack He's telling you what he's going to do. He's telling you when I do it, there's nothing that you can do about it. And that, that, that can really PO a lot of guys off. Right. When he talks about it and then he does it, but you, you have to stay, I get, you have to stay tough. You have to mentally, right. Because that can get you off off of what you're trying to do at any time. Because when you have a guy tell you what he's going to do and does exactly what he just told you he's going to do and you can't do anything about it. Right. So you have to just find a way to, okay, uh, he just said that and he just did that. Some guys uh, 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 come to the point, well, I'm, I'm just going to quit because there's nothing I can do because he's doing exactly everything that he just said. Right. You just have to fight through it. I mean, uh, <laughs> deal with what he's saying and, and stay mentally <laughs> right. challenged because it's, it's hard. It, 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 was, it, was, it was hard when you're facing a guy like that. I, I can't say that it was any, any moment on the floor that was easy because it wasn't. You, know, you brought up earlier about um, having fun. Like, when we go back, when we go back to our childhood, when we started playing our sport, I played football, obviously you played basketball, you know, when you're on the, the basketball court and it's just, it's just fun, right? That's our why majority. That's why we play, play basketball because it's fun. I feel joyful and it's joyous. But when you get to the professional level, the NBA level, is it, I mean, I know it's a job. I know there's different dynamics and there's all these different pressures. Um, is it tough? to tap into that joy and just to have fun because there's all these other things that are pulling at you? Oh, oh no question. Uh, you know, it, it, not only the things that's on the floor, it's the, the things that are away from the floor right. that uh, plays a part in it. You can have family issues at home, uh, you know, all the personal stuff uh, that, that can pull you away from uh what you're trying to do out there on the floor, it is, Grant, it is really, really tough. And I say that for any athlete, I don't care what sports you're playing, when you have off the field issues, it affects what you do on the floor, on, right. the, on the court, uh, on the, in, in the diamond, at the battles, by all that, it, it, plays a, it plays a big part. And those who, who never played sports, 
especially at the 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 big level right it's hard to comprehend they don't have a clue you know you you got some guys okay the way that they're paying athletes today is on another stratosphere right <laughs> You know, guys get out there on the field and, 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 okay, I just signed that big check. I don't have to do anything else. Mm-hmm. They don't, I don't, I don't need to focus as much as I, I did to get this money. I've gotten it now. Right. And, and some of them, you've seen it, you've seen it firsthand. It's oh, like yeah. the level of play go from 100 to 42 or <laughs> lower than that. It's like, right. They just check out. Great example. Look at this young man, LeBron James. Yeah. He get criticized from every, every side of the earth that you, you want to say. Just, I mean, he takes it. He takes those hits. He takes those blows. But it seems like he takes them and they bounces off him. He just continue to do better. You take you you take those shots and you use them as energy. Yeah. In my opinion, I think the, the young man, he does a great job at that, uh, 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 of, of staying focused and uh, always talk about, we had to get better every day. You have to get better. We, we have to get better. I have to get better. And I think he does an excellent job at it. It's obvious that we all know we're not going to play the same way every night. But if you put forth that effort, right, it can happen. For sure. You might not, you might not achieve it, but putting forth that effort to 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 do so, it speaks for itself. And that's when you separate the goods from the greats. Totally. The Magic Johnsons, the Larry Birds, the LeBron James. You know, I you have to you have to put those guys in an, in another category because they are whether you want to say it or right. not they are <laughs> in a different category oh yeah you know you you, you look at uh, lebron james and in in each year they talk about uh well he, he's declining i don't see it i don't see he might not be as more athletic as he used to be but i just don't see it but i think he's he's his IQ, his basketball IQ is off the charts and he just, he just stays focused Yeah, and, and, and he gets the job done somehow at 35 years old. Right. Who couldn't imagine a kid at 35? That's when you're declining. And I think he's getting better. He used, he used Giannis Adatacumba for getting the MVP award. He used that as motivation throughout the playoffs right most guys say well I'm, uh, uh, what more do you want me to do uh, well I'm, you know I'm, I'm not going to do anything else and, and and shut it down he didn't shut it down he took it to another level look okay you're the MVP but I have my fourth ring right I have my fourth NBA uh, finals MVP it, it speaks for itself Again, whether you like it or not, it speaks for itself. You can you can say all the other stuff, but it speaks for itself because the kid takes itself to another level, and, and that's not just physically, mentally. He's he's just a, I think he's a mentally strong kid. Totally. And when you play the years that he has in the NBA, I mean, he right out of high school. I mean, it, that's yeah. tough, and and to progress and develop, I think. I think it's great. I think there's probably little parts of his game where it's probably slowed down a little bit, but the reason why he can still dominate and he can still win championships is because I I believe it's wisdom. If you can actually, if you can reflect on all those years, right. And just because you slow down, you can still compete at at an elite level. You just have to use your body and your mind a little bit differently. And I think that he does that very well. Yeah. See, see, uh, you know, you can see a little bit of his athleticism, a little bit decline, right? But he uses his his smarts, his passing ability, uh, to to get shots off, to get other players shots. 
he uses the he uses the smart things, and which a lot of guys who play in the game today don't have that. And and I, I say it again, his IQ is such at a high level. Not only he makes himself look good, he makes his teammates mm. look good. And I and and and, and from being a, a a ball player and playing the game so long. I just I just watch him how he gets everybody involved. Right. And then he asserts himself. I'm going to get AD his sweet touches. I'm going to get uh Kyle Kuzma his, and, yeah. and after he does that then he 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 finds he his, his his niche and, and and carve you away. I just I just have so much respect for the way he approaches the game. Uh and you know as well as I know, you playing football, when you have people that think you don't, you're not playing the way they think you should play, then something's wrong. That's not always the case. Right. Exactly. And you know what's funny with, with LeBron? And a lot of people think he's a me before we type of guy. And he's actually the opposite. He's we before me. Exactly. Um, and And I think that wisdom that we were talking about, like him being – um, selfless and being vulnerable, um, you know, not take going to the hole every single time. He's passing around, he's dishing it out, he's getting everyone involved, he's creating energy, he's connecting the whole play. And um, there's a lot of dudes that don't do that in the NBA no, right now. Not at all, not at all. It's 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 a it's a lot of guys. You made a great point right there. It's a lot of guys that don't even want to be in that situation. Right. You know, uh, you know. One of the I forget what game it was. Uh, he drives and defense collapse on him, and he had two or three guys on him. You know, he should take that shot. Why? If two or three guys is on uh, on him, somebody's open. Exactly. And then he gets <laughs> criticized. Well, oh, you don't take the the last shot like Michael Jordan. Right. He made the right basketball play. Exactly. You know, I, I just don't understand it, you know. But, again, it, majority of those people who, 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 who make those criticisms, they've never been in a situation at that level. Exactly. So they, they, they would have done. And me and you being uh, former athletes and playing at the highest level, that was the correct play to make. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, Nick, it's funny. I know, I know you can, this re will resonate with you because there's a lot of people that just, it's, they have all these opinions. I call it uh, living in the cheap seats. People can sit way up there and talk all that shit, but they won't go in into the arena or they've never had a chance oh. to be in the arena and know what it feels <laughs> oh. like to, to go through all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I it's funny. I, I remember my brother, one of my older brothers were, we were at a, a magic game and um, he used to always talk about uh, the fans that get called down there to make a, a free throw a shot. And you got 22,000 people watching and some of them, you know, brick it up there or whatever. And you're like, Oh man, they, uh, I, that's an easy shot. I can make that shot. And one game he got called and he was down there on that floor and you have 22,000 people looking at you and he shot an air ball. Wow. And he, after, after it all was over, we, we were on our way home. He said, man, I just don't know how guys can really, really do it. They have a special skill because you have all those folks maybe cheering for you or cheering against you, you could feel it. He said, I was nervous as hell. Right. And I shot an air ball. I said, that's why I tell people all the time, watching and being out there is totally two different things. Oh, yeah. Big you time. could talk about, oh, I do this when I get, it's not that easy, bro. <laughs> it's not that easy. You may think it is. Right. And, and, and then, you know, they use this for an excuse. Oh, if you make X amount of dollars, you're supposed to. That, that don't mean anything. Right. That means nothing. 
<laughs> you know, because you, you, you buy a $22,000 car, it might not work the way that you thought it was going to work. It, right. it, you know, it, it's just not that easy. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Well, let's, let's go back to kind of where it started for you. Um, back in 1989 for the Orlando Magic, when you got picked in the first round and you were the very first person that got picked for, for the organization, yeah. what was that moment like? Like, walk me through what you're feeling. It was it was great. I I can remember the process of, you know, um, leading up into the draft. Uh, teams bring you in and work you out and have uh, interviews with you and background check and all that stuff. I, I I remember, you know, teams that picked before the Magic, the Bulls, the Pacers. I interviewed for all those teams. Me being a Chicago kid. I thought maybe the possibility that I might get drafted by the Bulls. Right. It was a it was a great process. Uh, uh, I, I came to Orlando having the eleven pick in the in the draft that that led up to went to Florida. Never been to Orlando. Always heard about Disney World. Always wanted to go to Disney World. Um, being in high school, our senior trip was to Disney World but my parents couldn't afford for me to go on my senior trip. But somehow I ended up in Orlando anyway. I think it was, wow. it was destined. It was meant to be coming in and working out. And then uh, I worked out for the other teams and then Orlando brought me back in for a second workout. Uh, I guess what, what I showed them, they were intrigued. They liked but anyway, the draft uh, was up on us. And friends of mine, even family members, like the Orlando Magic. Right. <laughs> that's not an NBA team. Never heard of that. And I'm, I was saying, well, it's a new franchise. This is the first year uh, the franchise will be in existence. It is an NBA team. But when I got drafted, I still had people I know, that's not an NBA team. And I'm trying to explain and def it is, but anyway, all that, that was a, that was great. I mean, the process was, it was wonderful. You know, again, me not never been, been to uh, Orlando, Florida. It was, it was great. And uh, me ending up in here in Orlando, I think it was meant to be, it was it really meant to be. And I, everything worked out well. Uh, right. Again, you mentioned being the first pick in the team's history. And a lot of people don't even know that to this day, that I, I am the first draft pick in Orlando Magic history, which is a, a, a trivia question. Yeah. And uh, I, didn't know until, I didn't know until I started doing research. I was like, oh, yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. Uh, I played the very first basketball game ever played in Central Florida. Uh, which was great. Uh, I was, uh, me and another gentleman, uh, my teammate, Michael Ansley, who was drafted in the second round from Alabama. We were the two rookies amongst the uh, veterans who were left for the supplemental draft. If you, if you say yeah. Sam Benson, Sidney Green, Reggie Theus, Dave Corzine, if that, that name, Back in the day, rings a bell. Um, you know, Terry Catlitch, Jerry Reynolds, and my buddy Scotty Skiles. So I, I was on the team with a bunch of veteran players who had played with other uh, ball clubs for a significant amount of time uh, of their careers. So right. it was it was it, it was it was a great moment. Uh, it's something that I always cherish and and, and remember. And I. I still have my uh, rookie jersey, even though it fits like a uh, <laughs> a, 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 a diving suit on me, real tight. But I still have it, and uh, I cherish it. <laughs> That's awesome, man. You know, we we talked about preparation, um, and I'm just interested because I know things have changed uh, since you played. I mean, there's a lot of focus on meditation and breathing and 
pre-performance routines and all that good stuff. So back in the day when, when you were playing, was there a routine that, that you followed on either the night before or the morning of or right before you went on court or when you're warming up? Was there a routine that, that got you prepared? Well, I used to, I used to take a little time uh, uh, even before the game and, and just sit by myself. And uh, I used to, it, it used to run through my head. I used to say this to myself all the time. And, uh, you know, we use this, you know, you, you know about sports. And I used to say to myself, kill my man, kill my man, kill my man on both ends of the floor, offensively and defensively. I used to, I say that over and over. And that was before the game. And then when we went out, we warmed up. I always sat at the end of the bench, the last seat while before the uh, announcement of the players. Everybody would maybe be in the middle of the bench, but I sat in that long seat at the end of the bench and I always had my head down. And I was repeating to myself, kill my man, kill my man, kill my man. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I, that's how I kind of got myself prepared and ready to, for the challenge. Uh, and when they call my name, I run out. And then after that, it's, it's, it's the, you know, guys give players a high five and on down the line. I used to, after the guys were sitting on the bench, I would run from the last seat again, slapping hands all the way down to the coaches. And then I run and take a leap on the floor. Mm-hmm. That was my routine. That was my get myself ready. Yeah. And I and that was for every game. Every game. Uh, it was the it was the same thing every game to to stay focused, get prepared, get mentally ready, because every night was a challenge. There were no nights off. It was a challenge. I challenged myself to to do well, to 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 be better than the last game. See, you're only as good as your last game. Exactly. And I used to challenge myself to be better. It might not, it might not go that way, but I did challenge myself to be better. Totally. That's awesome. Well, you know, and this is the, this is the part of my show where uh, this is where I want my listeners to kind of get a lesson, right? This is um, how we, how we deal with adversity. And, you know, we know for us to be successful, we have to fail. We have to have a relationship with failure. So it's kind of a two-part question, but how did you deal with overcoming mistakes within the game? Like, was there a way that you dealt with that? And then we'll go back to that game one in the NBA finals against the Rockets. Yeah. Yeah. And when you missed four free throws in a row, Mm -hmm. how do you bounce back for the game two? Oh man, Grant, I'm glad you asked that question because, you know, for years I never talked about that. It was something that, that really bothered me. It was like, you know, when you're a little kid, I'm gonna put this on my shoulder and if you knock it off, now we got the rumble. Right, right. I had that on my shoulder. And if somebody came and, 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 and a smart remark or, or something, oh, I was ready to, I was ready to get it on. Right. So it, it did bother me. It bothered me for a long time because I felt as though, you know, I'm out there trying my damnness. And I did. I missed I missed four free throws. But you wanna you wanna hang me out to dry uh for it. And it bothered me for a long time. And mentally, it 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 bothered my game. It changed my game. It changed me. I was tentative. I wouldn't, I wasn't aggressive, like, because I played, I like contact. I like to be physical. Right. You know, me being six, five and a half, six, six, I posted up a lot. I don't care if he was six, 10 or five, 10, you know, I used to be, wanted to be known as being a handful. I was hell on the box and, <laughs> and, and, and guys knew that. But when that happened to me, it changed me. I wasn't aggressive. I was tentative. I had became a jump shooter. Mm. 
only. And that wasn't me because I had a mid-range game. I posted up all the time. I got to the basket. I shot threes. I was aggressively rebounding. You know, it was in, it was it was like a, a broken record playing in my head. I don't want to get fouled. I don't want to get fouled. Mm. It was it did, and I, I I'll never forget. Again, like I said, it affected my game so much. And I, I remember when Chuck Daly was our coach, and he benched me because I wasn't I wasn't I, I it was deserving of the benching. I was I was supposed to be on the bench because I wasn't doing the things that they know I was capable of doing and the things that I knew that I was capable of doing. Mm. It was like I was I was just put it plain and simple like I was scared as hell. Right. I had no business on the floor. I had no business on the floor. And 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 one day I just went to the uh, coaches, Coach Daly's office, and I said, Coach, what do I need to do to get back on the floor? And he said something very simple to me. He said, be the Nick Anderson that I used to coach against. We used to talk about in our locker room. Mm -hmm. He's held on the post. He gets to the basket. And it, that resonated to me. The first half of the season, I played like crap. Mm. When I, I it, it, first half. And after that meeting, it was the second half of the season. We were playing Miami. We were going to Miami. And he said, you know what? I'm going to start you tonight. Even though I wasn't deserving to, to start. Right. He started me. And I wanted to prove to myself and I wanted to prove to everybody else that I can be the old Nick Anderson, that aggressive guy, that guy didn't back down for nobody. And I and I I put my mind to it. And that night I, I left that Miami game, if I'm not mistaken, with 27, 28 points. Wow. And getting to the free throw line. And then after that. You know, technical fouls in the game. Coach Daly was, he was, Nick has to shoot the technical. Which, in a lot of people, minds like, really? <laughs> right. Really? And rightfully so. Rightfully right. so. Right. And I would go up there and knock down the technical foul. And I, my confidence and in, and in, 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 in what I could do, which I knew I could do, is slowly started coming back and and to make a long story short that second half of the season i averaged 28 points a game wow i mean just because and i always i looked at it i said uh i had a coach that believed in me and that was chuck daly yeah he believed in me and he put me back out there said he should tell me before the game go do what you do Wow. Coach Chuck Daly believed in me when I didn't believe in myself and others did not believe in me either. Wow. It was an unfortunate situation. You know, it happens in the game. Yeah, it happens. Totally. It happens in the game, but I let it beat me down. I mean, it got the best of me. I mean, wow. it got the best of me. Uh, I used to see memes, uh, people smart remarks and uh when i go places it, it really it really bothered me but the best thing i do now uh, i talk about it it's something that i never used to talk about it it's something that happened i look at guys now in the league today you miss five six free throws in a close game oh he just missed for but back then right <laughs> it, it, it wasn't like that. You know, you, you get the dagger for oh, something yeah. like that. But uh, it is what it is. I'm glad I'm able to talk about it because it's something that I, I used to hate talking about. And it pissed me off to no end if you come to me and try to make fun about it. It really, yeah. it really bothered me. And um, it, 
you know, being older now, older, I guess that's, you know, being more mature mm -hmm. and uh, I can, I can live with it because uh, it's part of my career. And I say this and, and rightfully so I say this, uh, there's three things that I always said about Nick Anderson throughout my entire career. And I'm talking about high school, college, and the pros. Three things. College, I'm known for my play, but I'm known for hitting the last second shot, a three-pointer, to beat Indiana at Indiana at the buzzer, Bobby Knight co coaching. Wow. I'm known for that shot, hitting a 35-footer with two seconds on the clock to win the game. I'm known for, as a uh, professional, the steal from Michael Jordan. That comes up. Yep. And the last but not least, Nick Anderson misses four free throws against the Houston Rockets. Right. Those, I think, I think the most, the three most visible things and the most talked about things of my entire career. Right. And you know what, Nick, and I appreciate you being vulnerable with that, but I think everyone, everyone has that game. I mean, you go back to Kobe his rookie year when he missed four air balls in game five against the Jazz, right? Um, I mean, everybody, I mean, I'll tell, I've said this a lot on the show, but when I played, when I was in college, I had the worst game in my entire life. My entire career was towards the end of my career. I threw four interceptions. Uh, two of them were pick six. They ran back for touchdowns. I got sacked six times in a game. I had a really shitty day, but yeah. the lesson is how did I bounce back? How did I get back to my most confident self? How do I trust myself and let go of that stuff I have no control of. So, exactly. you know what I mean? So, and what's beautiful, and this is, this is a perfect segue into um, transformational coaching, is that for you, you had a transformational coach that allowed you to shift back into the old Nick, right? Yeah. So, and I don't know, maybe, maybe uh, Coach, Daly, coach Daly is the coach, but through all the coaches, who's that transformational coach, that coach that just – impacted you um, as an individual and also as a basketball player? Um, wow. It, I can say it, it's, it's a few co coaches. I mean, it's not one in particular. I think school coach. May his soul rest in peace. I mean, he was a disciplinarian and he stayed on me to, to do the right thing on the court and away from the court. I mean, he was an extension of my father away from home. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was a great inspiration among my, 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 my high school career. It wasn't just all basketball with him. He wanted me to be a, 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 a good individual, good human being, a good young man, do the right thing. So I would say him in and, and college, you know, uh, it, it was it was it was two people, um, Coach Jimmy Collins, who recruited me while I was in high school to go to the University of Illinois, and Coach Lou Henson. We just lost Coach Henson, uh, maybe uh, maybe two months ago. Uh, he stayed on me, and I used to wonder why. Okay, I got this in high school. <laughs> now I'm getting it in college. Right. It was because. They seen something to me that I may not have seen in myself. I mean, Coach Henson used to ride me like a horse. I mean, and I'm like, why is this? Why? Right. And and it's funny. Just a few years ago, I was inducted to the University of Illinois Hall of Fame, and uh, this surprised me. I, I never expected this. When we were there, um, he came up, and this all a lot of the former players that he coached, uh, people that he'd been around, administration, and he mentioned he said Nick Anderson is the best basketball player that I ever coached, mm. and my mouth hit the floor. <laughs> I bet <laughs> he had never said that. I'd never heard him say that. Right. And and I felt, 
you know, I felt, I want what word? I don't know what to use. I mean, I was, it was a, it was a, it was a feeling that came over to me. I just like, I was like, wow. And then I felt bad for all his former players that was sitting there and those words came out of his mouth. Mm. But he said, Nick Anderson is the best basketball player I ever coached. And I'm, I mean, yeah. it, it, it was touching. Yeah. And then uh, on the next level, uh, especially my, 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 my first 10 years, it had to be Coach Brian Hill. Brian Hill was our coach that we went to the finals with. And then Coach Hill stayed on me too. Mm-hmm. Just like my high school coach, and my college coaches. Coach Hill was a great inspiration to me being ex- excess, uh, su- successful as I was mm. because he, he stayed on me. He said, he should tell me, you're the, you the, you the best defender on this team. We need you every night. He, he rolled me like that. I want to see you coming out and excel every night. And, 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 you know, most, most kids today, I say today's kids, I don't say all of them, but a lot of them, they can't take criticism like that. The skin is not. I agree. It's, it's, it's not tough as it used to be, but those coaches played a significant role in my life as a, as a basketball player and as a young man going from a, a boy to a man and my growth mm. because they wanted to see me do well away from the floor. I mean, it was, it was great, Grant. I mean, my, my, my dad was a disciplinarian and I had it when I left the house, it never stopped. Right. <laughs> it, it, it never stopped. So that's, that's a, that's a good thing for me. And, uh, I'm 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 great I'm grateful that it it went that way because it could have went another way. Right. Exactly. So I'm I'm thankful for that and uh, at the time being a young man, you know, you're 17, 18 years old, you know, you know, you want wondering why is everybody riding me? Mm-hmm. And they because they seen something in me that I didn't see in myself. Right. And I'm thankful for it. You know what I love about coaches like that? Um, I've had a few of them throughout my career, but to me, a really good coach or called a transformational coach are the coaches, even when they ride you, um, they're coaching the heart of the athlete. And more often than not, there is that like really, really good coaches have that balance where they'll push the shit out of you, but they'll circle back with you and they'll connect with you on a human level. So they'll like, there's coaches I've been around where, you know, they will ride you during practice, but they will hug you and they'll high five you and they'll always check in on you and they'll always yeah. want to know what's going on outside of the game. And to me, is like, that's the stuff that makes the, my frequency just go. Yeah. I, I think one coach that I can honestly say that fits that mold today, and I, uh, I know there's probably more out there, but I think Coach Mike Szczeski is that way. Oh, yeah. Uh, totally. I, I think he is. He, he's, he's that – He's gonna he's gonna get on to you. He's gonna he's gonna ride your ass and he's gonna uh, he's gonna love you at the same time. Exactly. So so you you know he, he's had uh lots of successful players away from the court because of his mentorship that he gave them. Totally. A hundred percent. hundred percent. One more question here before we sign off. Nick, I can talk to you for hours, man. I mean <laughs> I really can. This I don't mind. I don't mind, man. This I is love great. it. I love it. Yeah. Well, when you think about your whole career, um, this is where, you know, I believe where development happens is how we get caught 1% better, but how we reflect, reflect on our experiences, reflect on our career. So when you, when you actually reflect on your whole career, what do you think you've learned the most about yourself? Oh man. I learned, I, I learned to, and my dad used to say this to me all the time, especially, you know, I remember when my dad was laying on his sick bed before he passed. He said, he used to tell me this when I was 
coming up and, and, and into my adulthood. He said, treat people like you want to be treated, even though they might not treat you the same way. And I, that always resonate and always come back in my head that, you know, I, I, if I can't help you, I'm damn sure not trying to hurt you. Right. That's just me, regardless right. of what you may think or how you may feel about me. You know, I'm out to, to help. And um, I've learned that about me. I enjoy helping others. It makes me feel good inside. You don't have, you don't, you don't necessarily have to help someone just being financially. When you're giving somebody your time, your ear, listen, things like that, it, it goes a long way. And I, 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 can, I cannot get enough of how much I enjoy helping people. Yeah. You know, even, even though I don't play anymore, I can go to the gym and I watch a lot of the young guys play and shoot around. And some of them don't know, who, the younger ones don't know who I am from that paint on the wall. But you got older guys would tell them something about me. Mm. And then I can get out there and I, I shoot around and they watch me say, oh, he, you know, you still shoot, that type of thing. You know, like, yeah. Well, can you help me? How do you do this? You played at this level. How do you do that? And I mean, it, it's, you think that two minutes, that two minutes out there, and then it turns into two hours. Right. I enjoy it. You know, uh, I think I still have a lot to give the game today. I still think I like, have a got lot to give just young men and women in general. Because don't look at me and think that everything was peaches and cream. Because it wasn't. Right. I had my peaks and valleys on and off the court. I had situations that you don't want anybody to know about to talk about i've been there i'm a use me i'm a great example use me use me i tell my sons that there's nothing you've done young man that i haven't done that road that you're traveling down trust me i've seen it plenty of times right so the the younger generation think they're slick Oh, I'm going to do this and my parents don't know about it. Right. Hey, man. I've been there. <laughs> you're not fooling them. Trust me. You ain't, you're just fooling yourself. Yeah. So I want young men and young women today to use Nick Anderson and as an example. Come to me. Talk to me. I'm that athlete, that person that you can touch. I want, I want to... I want to help. If I can help in some type of way, I want to help. That's just me. Yeah. I want to give back what was given to me. And, and, and I say this, people ask me all the time, who did you want to model yourself out after as a person and a basketball player? And I've played against the best in the world. Mm -hmm. <laughs> best in the world. But the guy that I always wanted to be like Grant was Joe Dumas. Hmm. I mean, he's a class act. Yeah, tenacious. He's a class act. Yes, he's a class act. I always wanted to be Joe Dumas. Hmm. He was my inspiration. And he's, he still is this, to, this today. I mean, I, I have so much respect for him. It's, it's unbelievable. And, and if you want to call me a Joe Dumas, hey, I'll be more than happy. Right. <laughs> I'm more than it. happy. I love it. Yep. Well, you, you hit on something that I talk about a lot on the show, especially in the role that I'm in. The best role in the world, I don't care. I'm, I'm not talking about basketball, coaching. It's about being in service. When you're in service, that is the best role. I mean, to me, that's like, 
the highest level of, of vibration for me, at least when I'm sitting there and I'm authentically helping you and I'm just completely in service, man, it's, it's a really, really, really great feeling. It's a great feeling. And uh, this is this upcoming, upcoming season will be my 15th year as the ambassador of the Orlando magic. Mm. And I, 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 that's, that's, a, that's, I take that very seriously to represent an organization. I have to represent them in the highest, in the highest. And, and, and I, I do my damnedest of, of, of trying to do so. That's awesome. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. Yeah. Well, Nick, how can my listeners, how can they connect with you, follow you on social media and just follow things that you're doing right now? Well, well, I'm on I'm on social media. I'm on Instagram, and my Instagram name is Old School Player, not not old. It's O L E School <laughs> Player, P L A Y A. I love it. Follow me on Instagram. Um, I'm, I I belong to a, a organization called WSA. It's World Sports Alumni. Myself and many other great athletes swimmers, basketball players, uh, boxers, uh, Pinklin Thomas, uh, old boxer, uh, Riddick Bowe, who's a great friend of mine. And uh, you go on down the line for Super Bowl champions and uh, look out for WSA. It's, it's a great organization and uh, does great work for, for uh, communities. And our, our organization is expanding uh rapidly so follow me on uh instagram all right beautiful nick thanks so much man for your for your mindset and your your energy man i really appreciate you sharing your story man hey grant anytime i'm here for you man uh, let's chop it up anytime let's do it all right my brother take it easy man and god bless you and yours you too man thank you so much all right now all right man have a good one you too